as a physician who takes care of many patients with Tourette syndrome, uh, welcome the opportunity to help you understand a little bit more about that today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we as doctors mean when we say someone has Tourette syndrome. And afterward, Lillian, who actually has Tourette syndrome, will tell you what it's really like. Tourette's was first identified by this gentleman, George Gilles de la Tourette, in the late 1800s. And since that time, our formulation of what Tourette syndrome is has changed many times. Our current understanding is found in this book, The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-5. According to our diagnostic manual, we make the diagnosis of Tourette in anyone who has at least two motor and one vocal tick that have been going on for at least one year. Ticks, for those of you who are not familiar, are sudden muscle twitches or vocalizations. Ticks may be preceded by an urge or an uncomfortable feeling that is relieved when the individual releases their tick. And this may be similar to the feeling you may have when you have an itch that you need to scratch and the relief that you may feel after you scratch that itch. Now, ticks are somewhat involuntary, but there also is a voluntary component to ticks, meaning that they can be suppressed or held in to some degree. But when someone tries to hold them in, that leads to an increase in this uncomfortable urge until eventually the tick has to come out. So Lillian's going to tell you what it's like living with ticks and Tourette's and how she's learned to better control her ticks. What I'd like to do is I'd like to focus and uh, give you some more information about the urge. Because when most people think of Tourette, they think about the visible part or the audible part, the ticks themselves. What they may not recognize is that there is an invisible or internal part, the urge, that is often quite distressing to the person, even if they appear calm and tick-free on the outside. Now, we all have urges. We all know what urges are. But we don't typically think about our urges unless they're telling us to do something that is socially inappropriate or awkward. But for someone who has Tourette's, there's a constant battle in their mind, trying to balance what they want to do, what they feel is socially appropriate to do, and what their urges are telling them to do. Yawning is something that we all experience. And before we yawn, we all have an urge that's very similar to the urge that someone with Tourette's has before they tick. And when we let our yawn out, we have relief of that urge, again, similar to what someone with Tourette's may feel. We can hold in our yawns, but when we do that, it's uncomfortable, and there is a buildup of this discomfort until we have to let the yawn out, oftentimes in very exaggerated fashion. Again, very similar to what someone with Tourette's may feel when trying to hold in their urges. Now, talking about yawning, looking at someone yawn, or looking at a slide of people yawning can induce in many people an urge to yawn. And I actually see some people out there yawning. And maybe it's because I'm boring and it's late. but. Um, other people, I think, are trying to be a little bit more polite and suppress their yawns, um, suppress their urge to yawn. And for those of you who are suppressing, it is that conflict between the urge to let your yawn out and what you think is more socially appropriate to do to try to hide from me that you're yawning while I'm talking. And that's the conflict that may be very similar to what is going on in the mind of someone who has Tourette's. Now, to better understand this urge a little more, I'd like, hopefully you'll indulge me in playing in a little game called Simon Says, which I think many of you probably remember from when you're little. 
Now this game, if you think about it, is really all about suppressing urges. It's something that little kids aren't really very good at doing. And so I hope you'll um, play it with me and, and we can get a little bit of an idea. For those of you who are not familiar with the game, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to give you commands. I'm gonna tell you to do something. And if I say Simon Says first, then you must do it. If I don't say Simon Says, you do nothing. But if I say Simon Says, then you must do what I say. Now I'll say I can't really see the back of the room, so I hope nobody cheats, because um, I want to get everybody participating, I hope. So let, let's try it, and I hope you'll indulge me. Raise your right hand. Okay, I saw one in the back, so that person didn't in, suppress their urge, so we'll try it one more time. Touch your nose. Okay. Simon says, touch your ear. Stick out your tongue. Simon says, touch your knee. Touch your hip. Simon says, touch your neighbor on the shoulder. Simon says, touch your neighbor on the knee. Simon says, touch your neighbor on the nose. <laughs> Simon says, touch your neighbor on the belly. <laughs> Simon says, touch your neighbor on the... Now, I'm sensing that some of you are a little worried where I'm going to say. <laughs> so, so how far would you actually go? Would you touch your neighbor wherever I said, just because I said Simon says? Or would you suppress your urge, my, your, my command to you, would you suppress that based on what is socially and morally appropriate, depending on who your neighbor is? Um, and that is, again, the battle that may be going on in the mind of someone with Tourette. And you may imagine that this can be quite distressing and distracting, even if they are successful in hiding all of their tics. So before I turn it over to Lillian, I'd like to leave you with one other idea. I'm going to show you a picture of this purple elephant. And I'd like you to study this picture and put this picture in your mind, try to remember as many details about this elephant as you can. And I'd like to use this elephant to introduce the idea that urges are not all about our need to move or make noises. Urges can apply to our thoughts as well. Usually uncomfortable thoughts, distressing thoughts, things we're anxious about, or song lyrics that we can't get out of our mind. And so for the rest of the day, now that you have this picture of the purple elephant in your mind, I'd like you to try to not think about that purple elephant anymore. And every time that purple elephant pops into your head, I'd like you to try to suppress that urge to think about it. And you may find the more that you do that, the harder, harder and harder it will become, and the more and more that elephant will come to mind. And so if that does happen to you, please use that as an opportunity to let the purple elephant remind you about what you've learned about Tourette's and what Lillian's about to tell you about Tourette's and use the purple elephant to help you continue the dialogue after you leave here about Tourette's syndrome. So thank you. I'm gonna turn it over now to Lillian, and I hope she's being very, very brave to come up here, and I think you may be able to appreciate that as poised as she will be as she is speaking to you, many of those conflicts and battles in, um, that I talked about uh, raging in the mind when someone appears calm may be going on for her as well. Um, so please welcome Lillian and thank you very much. Cock! Asshole! Cock! Asshole shit! Shit! Cock! Shit! Dumb shit! Bitch! Ass bitch! Cock that! Ugh. This is how the entertainment industry commonly portrays Tourette syndrome. It's mocked. It's a joke. In fact, this episode of South Park is why some people even know what Tourette's is. When I have told people that I have Tourette's, some have actually asked me, oh, that cussing disorder? Like in South Park, what cuss words do you say? There is a large misconception that what South Park is mocking, coprolalia, is the same as Tourette's. 
And while 10% of patients with Tourette's also experience symptoms of coprolalia, they are not the same. The other 90% do not. <clears throat> this, episode South Park, this episode of South Park is funny, and I still laugh at it. But when others laugh at me, while I do find it a compliment to be considered funny, I do not like to be thought of as a joke. I was diagnosed with Tourette's in the third grade. But my mother had never heard of Tourette's, so before then, I was always getting in trouble. She asked me, why do you keep throwing your arms up in the air? Why do you keep squeaking or shaking your head? But I couldn't tell her why. I didn't know why. Sometimes I tell her I didn't even know I was doing it, but what sense does that make if you've never heard of Tourette's? She often thought I was lying, and looking back, I don't really blame her, because she would tell me to take out the trash, but I wouldn't do it and would just tell her I never heard her. <laughs> I had a tick where I'd cough and clear my throat, so my mom took me to the doctor. They told her I probably just had an allergy or probably needed to take my inhaler more often. She was always trying to help. I used to have bangs, and I used to have a tick where I'd shake my head, so my mom thought I was trying to shake the hair out of my eyes. So she took it upon herself to cut my bangs. The only problem with that was that she'd never wear her glasses, so we all know how that story ends. <laughs> to avoid incidents like these and terrible haircuts, I became pretty good at disguising my tics, except for right now, because this is one of the most tic-inducing environments I've ever been in. Some of my less obvious ones are like this. Looks like I'm just wiping my nose. Or I have one where my arm tenses up, kind of like I'm flexing, except it's for a long period of time, it's really tiring, and no one around ever wants to see my rippling biceps. <laughs> this one is especially annoying when I'm trying to sleep, as you can imagine all tics are when I'm trying to sleep. Other ones when I'm trying to sleep would be like, I put my head on the pillow, and then my head just wants to jab into the pillow and become one with it. Or my arm is on my side, and my arm tries to jab into my side. So to avoid that, I'll put my arm up here, but then the tensing one starts again. So sometimes you just can't win. The arm tensing one is especially annoying when I'm trying to take a test, too. Because like, if you can imagine, you have a time limit trying to bubble in an answer or write a time dry essay, and your arms just shaking like this. But I have accommodations for these. I have what's called a 504 plan. So I get extra time on test, or extra time to turn in homework assignments, or I can take breaks in class. But I've never liked to use these accommodations because I don't like being treated differently from my Tourette's. In my mind, I'm not really different from anyone. There's no such thing as normal. Everyone has their thing, and my thing is that I twitch. Despite misunderstandings and quizzical looks, I'd say I've really only been bullied once for my Tourette's. I remember I was in elementary school in the girls' bathroom washing my hands, and this group of girls came in, and they started mimicking my blinking tick. They kept asking, why are you blinking? <laughs> and I had a mantra that I would tell myself, which was, I didn't choose to have Tourette's, but you could choose how you treat me. And I thought that would help me in this instance, but it didn't. I was so upset, I decided I never wanted to tick in front of anyone ever again, not even myself. So I'd be sitting at home watching SpongeBob, and I'd feel the urge to punch my stomach. So I'd sit, and I'd concentrate on keeping my hands at my side. Otherwise, I felt like I was letting Tourette's win. I didn't really know what I was fighting for at the time, though. I was just angry and scared. I worried about my future. I worried I'd never have friends, or never find a job, or never be loved. Because if I couldn't accept me, who would? As I've gotten older, I learned that I was letting Tourette's win by not letting my tics out. It never occurred to me that I didn't choose to have Tourette's, but I could choose how to treat myself. I finally figured out how to treat myself after going through a program, a program called Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Tics, or CBIT. CBIT essentially teaches habit reversal. It started in the 10th grade. I started working with my therapist, Gail Reiner, one of the most fantastic women I've ever met, and we met every week for about a couple months, and then the sessions spaced out. And in these sessions, I learned what are called competing responses. And I don't have a lot of time to go into the science behind a competing response, so I'll just show you. So, instead of punching my stomach, every time I felt the urge to do that, I would press my two palms together like this. The idea is to use both sides of your brain, so you use both sides of your body, and you hold it for 90 seconds while doing your breathing exercise. It's essentially like retraining your brain. And it helps because not only are your competing responses usually less obvious, even if it does look weird if I'm standing like this, it's still less painful 
and less obvious and less than if I'm doing this. So I also learned how to make up my own competing responses for if I were to develop for if I were to develop future ticks, which I do. For example, in March I went to Disneyland and when you're waiting in line to get into Disneyland, they scan your ticket and it makes a little whistling noise. And of course, since you're at Disneyland, you're in line for so long, so I heard the whistling over and over and over again. And then I started getting the urge that Dr. Friedman was talking about. And I was like, oh, great. And I looked at my sister and I said, Rosie, I think I'm about to get a new tick. And then she was trying not to laugh at me, but it was too late. I was whistling all day long. <laughs> Another example is in January, I went to the Monster Jam and when I was walking back to my car, it was like 10 at night, so it's cold and it's January, and cold weather inflames arthritis. And of course, I have arthritis because there's not much that isn't wrong with me. So then I always get it in my knees. So I went like this because I thought it would help me. I was like, Lillian, why did you do that? Because then I walked the whole way to my car, every step I took, kicking myself in the butt. <laughs> I was very sore the next day, but it was a great learning experience because I know to dress warmer next year. I truly believe I'm beginning to accept myself now. I once never wanted to talk to anyone about my dreads. I didn't even want people to know that I had dreads. And now look where I am. I'm able to laugh about some of my tics now, like what I call my Monster Jam tic or my Disneyland tic. But again, no one should feel like a joke. I know I don't because I don't let dreads define who I am. I once thought dreads was something that happened to me, but now I realize it's a part of who I am but it's not all I am. I am also a future Triton. I got to turn down Berkeley to go to UCSD next semester. <laughs> I am also a fisherman and a hardworking student and a sister and a daughter. There's no one thing we have to be. Adversity doesn't have to define you. We may not be able to choose what happens to us, but we can choose how we treat ourselves and others. Thank you.